The origins of those who slither in the dark is traced back to Sothis's arrival to Fodlin in the far distant past, when she created the children of the goddess and bestowed her the knowledge to Fodlin's natives. Through these actions, Sothis gave rise to the highly futuristic civilization of Agartha, composed of humans, while her children founded their own society, Nabatea, and distributed themselves through Fodlin while claiming leadership positions. And even though both groups coexisted for a time, the Agarthans eventually grew prideful and came to resent their situation, and not helping matters was that the so-called progenitor god had replaced their divine pantheon, willingly or not. All this culminated in them waging war against Sothis and her children. For this purpose, the Agarthans crafted Pillars of Light, also known as Giant Magical Missiles, and while these did purge many Nabataean cities, they failed to damage Sothis, whom in retaliation annihilated most of their populace, forcing the survivors to hide underground along with their remaining technology. From here onwards, they plotted revenge against the beasts they believed had banished them, giving shape to the group's known incarnation. Your eyes, hair, ears, and blood. We remember it all. We remember how you ruined us. How you stole our light and condemned us to eternal darkness. Now, suffer the wrath of the Agarthans! Their first try at revenge took place years later, when the group got in contact with Nemesis, a human thief, and led him to the Holy Tomb where Sothis lay dormant as a consequence of rebuilding the world Agartha had destroyed. Through their aid, Nemesis harvested Sothis's bones to create the Sword of the Creator and gained her crest of flames from her blood. With his newfound power, Nemesis recruited allies and kept killing more children of the goddess to empower his forces with new crests and weapons, eventually leading him to massacre Xanado, their last known settlement. But just when it appeared the Slitherer's revenge had been fulfilled, around a century later, the combined might of the Adrestian Empire and the Church of Seros, whose saints were secretly surviving Nabataeans, challenged Nemesis's rule in Imperial Year 32, eventually killing him in Year 91. Given Nemesis's knowledge and weapons, the Church suspected someone must have been helping him, and an investigation quickly took place, yet it ended up going nowhere, as the Slitherers had once again gone into hiding, taking Nemesis's body along with them. Years later, those who slither in the dark attempted to destroy Garag Mach Monastery with a spare javelin of light, but their effort was foiled thanks to the protection Sothis had placed in the Holy Tomb, redirecting the weapon into Alel and turning it into a valley of lava. Besides this, leftovers of a document hidden in Abyss raises the possibility the group was involved during the Fargus Rebellion of the year 747, seemingly adopting the role of benefactors by granting Lug, its leader, the means to get soldiers without the Empire's notice and even weapons similar to Hero's relics. It also suggests the tactician Pan was linked to all of this, but the nature of his involvement is unknown. Regardless, by the time of the year 751 had arrived and the Church had granted Fargus its independence after defeating the Empire, the Slitherers were nowhere to be seen. Around 300 years passed without any visible activity from the group, which soon came to a halt as their modus operandi adopted a more direct approach. In Imperial Year 1165, the Holy Kingdom of Fargus had just been cured from a deadly plague by Cornelia, an Imperial scholar. Seeing how beloved she became in the kingdom for her deed, the Agarthans seized the opportunity and silently replaced her with an impersonator of their own, using their resources to replicate the scholar's appearance to a T. And while Dimitri, the kingdom's young prince, noticed Cornelia had changed her personality and even likes with no foreshadowing, it wasn't enough to stop King Lambert from hiring her as a court mage. With her newfound status, the fake Cornelia had not only political power in the kingdom, but also control of the king's second wife, Anselma, previous consort of Emperor Ionius of Adrestia, exiled due to political strife shortly after bearing a child, Edelgard who was now hiding under the name Patricia with Cornelia's aid. Although she was the queen consort, in truth, my father and stepmother were not even allowed the dignity of being alone together, and the one who persistently inserted herself between them was their intermediary, your captor. It was Cornelia herself. 
In 1167, House Ordelia of the Leicester Alliance was intervened by the Empire for having tried helping Adrestia's House Hrim defect. House Hrim, now under Duke Iyer's control, the Empire's Prime Minister, sent staff to replace the people from Ordelia. A witness unknowingly noticed members of the Slitherers between their ranks, who proceeded to perform lethal crest experiments on the House's scions while under Imperial supervision. With the Empire monitoring our every move, my parents could do nothing but watch in horror as all of this unfolded. One after another, the children died, till the only one left was me. Upon seeing me, the mages were delighted. They realized that their experiments had finally succeeded. Sure enough, they ran a test and saw that two crests coexisted within me. By the time they got one of Ordelia's kids to survive and host two crests on her body, but not without compromising her lifespan, the Slitherers called the ordeal a success and left the area. By 1171, Volkard von Arendel, on Salma's brother, fled to Fargus along with his niece Edelgard and hid in Ferdiad to protect her when the most important imperial houses were stripping away the Emperor's power. During their stay, not only both met Lambert and Dimitri, word eventually reached on Salma that Edelgard Edelgard was also in kingdom territory, and seeked answers from, quote-unquote, Cornelia, who told her friend that Lambert was the one keeping Edelgard away from her and hiding her whereabouts, causing her grief. Even worse was that Arendelle suddenly left with Edelgard to the Empire one day in 1174, losing not only her chance to see Edelgard again, but also her brother, who, unbeknown to her, was now being impersonated by none other than Talus, the boss of those who slither in the dark. And just like that, Cornelia seized the opportunity she had been looking for. Right you are. Very well. I have an old tale that I would like you to hear, if I may. About something that happened ten years ago. Something Patricia said about how she wished to see her real daughter again, no matter who or what she had to sacrifice to do so and about how I made her wish come true at the cost of the king's head. In 1176, Patricia took part in a collaborative assassination plot between kingdom nobles unhappy with the king's latest reforms, such as Viscount Clyman, and Agarthans to kill Lambert during one of his visits with Dusker while framing Dusker for the regicide, with Cornelia even promising she would escape and meet with her daughter. Thus, the tragedy of Dusker took place. Only Dimitri survived, but not without trauma, a desire for revenge, and suspicions against his uncle Arundel, whose last actions still roamed in his mind. Yet despite being the only living witness, his pleas in Dusker's defense were ignored, and the corrupt kingdom nobles tricked the populace into genociding Dusker. As for Anselma, while evidence points out she did escape Dusker, the records of her movements essentially stop there. Meanwhile, in the Empire, Tullus, under Arundel's guise, contacted Duke Iyer and quickly established a partnership to seize power. A move so shocking, church officials were convinced Arundel had to have been in cahoots with the Duke since the beginning. With the assistance of House Vestra, the Emperor's eleven kids were captured, and the Garthans were allowed to perform crest experiments on them beneath the Imperial Palace, aiming to give one of them the fabled Crest of Flames, intending to use them later as a soldier-slash-puppet emperor to conquer all of Odolin. Only Edelgard made it through, at the expense of her lifespan, mental health, and goodwill for Fodolin's crest system and the church that had long since protected it. At long last, the Slitherers had all the pieces needed to bring their dreams to fruition, and yet their puppet will soon complicate things. It is the same as yours, the Crest of Flames. When it manifested for me, I swore a silent oath. For the sake of my family, and for all the poor souls whose lives were traded for my existence, for their sake, I will build a world where such meaningless sacrifice is never again sanctioned. As Emperor, I will change the world. I swear it. Determined to recover her agency and overhaul Fodlin's crest system, Edelgard and her vassal, Hubert, struck a deal behind Duke Iyer's back with half of the party involved with the Imperial insurrection, including those who slither in the dark. While the exact details are unknown, the end result would be that if successful, all supporters would be pardoned, Duke Iyer and dissenters would be incarcerated slash purged, and Adrestia's conquest would be led by none other than Edelgard herself. For this purpose, she allied herself with 
fight the Slitherers and used their resources to improve her odds in an all-out war, all while Hubert researched the group for the sake of facilitating their destruction, as neither of them intended the Agarthans to walk away unharmed once all was over. Through Arendelle's aid, who by now was the Empire's regent, Edelgard had Euritza, one of her allies, hired in Garagmok Monastery in the year 1178 as a sword instructor thanks to Arendelle's reputation as a church follower. Two years later, as Hubert and Edelgard attended Garagmok to study and gather intel, the Imperial Princess and the instructor assumed the identities of the Flame Emperor and the Death Knight respectively causing havoc to further their plans while collaborating with the Agarthans' shenanigans, whom, in 1179, had placed Solon, a senior agent, inside the church under the guise as Tomas, a returning librarian from Ordelia territory. Chapter 4 marks the first instance of Agarthan machinations in the main story. During the Western Church's plot to infiltrate Garrig Mach's holy mausoleum, both Edelgard and the Slitherers send support of their own forces in the form of the Death Knight and a Dark Mage, hoping to steal St. Saros's bones from her supposed coffin. And while the plan ends up a failure, both parties become aware that Saros's coffin contained, in reality, the Sword of the Creator, that Byleth was compatible with it and was somehow capable of using its power despite the sword lacking a crest stone, leaving Talus lost in thought. Also, Edelgard lends the Agarthans the Death Knight for future use. In Chapter 5, Solon is shown in the Golden Deer Root, inducing Claude's distrust of the Church of Saros. Other heroes also lost themselves by continuing to use the relics, transforming into black beasts with twisted souls. There used to be a great many records regarding the dark history of the relics. Used to be. They have been destroyed across all of Fodlan, stripped from their shelves, including those that resided at this very library. You make it sound like the church is covering up the truth. But now that you mention it, Rhea was very specific about not wanting anyone to find out what happened at Conan Tower. Hey, Tomas, why are you telling us all of this? It seemed like you were searching for answers about the relics. What is a librarian if not a guide in the search for knowledge? In Chapter 6, the Agarthans send the Death Knight to kidnap Flane and extract some of her blood, deeming it important for their experiments. Byleth and company eventually find the Death Knight's hideout along with Flane and some red-haired girl and fight the guy. During the struggle, Edelgard shows up as the Flame Emperor and forces the Death Knight to retreat before following suit. And while everyone celebrates the rescue, unbeknownst to nearly all, Monica, the girl recovered along with Flane that had gone missing from Garrig Mach last year, was in actuality a new Slitherer impersonator, Kranya, who in the following months would pretend to finish Monica's studies while keeping an eye on Edelgard. And while everyone was looking for clues in that chapter, Dimitri is found in the library reading about the church's donations and notices how Arendelle donations suddenly stopped one day in the year 1174. Then in chapter 8, Arendelle, end quote, arrives in Garrig Mach and stays in the area for a while, seemingly for innocuous reasons. Meanwhile, Tomas, end quote, leaves to Remire Village to begin his experiments with Flane's blood with their villagers, but not before leaving Claude a sketch of the Immaculate One. By the end of the month, most villagers started killing each other, forcing the church to act, and when the crew notices Tomas in the area, Solon removes his guise in front of everyone, gloats about the success of his test, and retreats, which happens to leave Claude conflicted about whether his goal of uncovering the truth would be for the best or not. It's also worth noting that by this time, most Agarthans have figured out Byleth is Sothis Reborn and treat them as such. In Chapter 9, it's implied the Slitherers lure a few students into an abandoned chapel before turning some into demonic beasts while endangering the rest, a process Kranya secretly supervises. As Byleth's class and Geralt come to their aid, the latter notices how the monsters have odd objects around their forehead and also turn back into students when slain. Before Geralt reaches any conclusions though, Kranya swoops in and stabs him in the back, which Byleth tries to prevent with a divine pulse, but fails. In Chapter 10, Edelgard and the Slitherers have a secret union near Garrick Mach, where Talus tells Kranya to stay with Solon in the sealed forest as he needs her for something. 
Edelgard, meanwhile, threatens Tullus in frustration but fails to intimidate him. And while all of this happens, the Blue Lion's route shows Dimitri eavesdropping the whole thing, and due to the choice of words used, ends up convinced that Edelgard ordered the Agarthans to cause the tragedy of Dusker. Later in the chapter, the church finds the Slitherers in the forest and sends Byleth with their class to deal with them. Kranya shows up and reveals her true form, threatens to kill them all, is instantly outmatched, and then flees to ask Solon for help, who quickly sacrifices her, much to her shock. Through Kranya's sacrifice, Solon banishes Byleth into a void of dark magic, tasting bittersweet victory. What happened to our professor? They were swallowed by the mystical darkness of the forbidden spell. An eternity wandering in a void of nothingness, never to return to this world. To think, we almost had the sword of the creator. To Solon's dismay though, Byleth soon breaks free from his spell through fusing with Sothis, becoming stronger than ever before, putting him down for good. Then in chapter 11, Edelgard's coup against Duke Iyer goes off without a hitch, successfully becomes the Emperor, and subsequently infiltrates the Holy Tomb with the Imperial Army to steal the Crest Stones, so the Agarthans can make demonic beasts for her upcoming fight with Rhea. From this point onwards, the game timeline branches out, affecting the status the Slitherers will find themselves in. If Byleth supports Edelgard, she foregoes her original plan and softens the church's forces with a conventional invasion using her own military force, thus leaving the Agarthans in the sidelines. And while this does lead to a victory, it also means she isn't equipped with the means to fight Rhea in her dragon form, leading to her escape. In the kingdom, Rhea and the church are quickly granted asylum by Dimitri, while Rhea officially crowns him king, and both parties form a unified front against Adrestia. Meanwhile, the Agarthans continue supporting the Empire by providing troops and demonic beasts. It isn't enough to break the war's stalemate until Byleth returns five years later. Later in Hubert's paralogue, Arundel slash Tallis approaches Hubert and asks him to help with saving a few minions that were doing experiments in the sealed forest. Once that's over, Hubert notes how his request was likely a means for the Slitherers to intimidate the Empire, yet their success ultimately compromises the Agarthans' odds. In Chapter 16, Edelgard coordinates with her Black Eagle Strike Force a secret attack against the kingdom in Fort Aryan Road for the sake of killing two birds with one stone, as not only the operation would weaken Fargus, but also the Slitherers, as Cornelia resides on that fort. Once the strike is done, Arundel visits Edelgard and demands answers as Cornelia had planned to sabotage the kingdom before her demise. And after refusing her excuses, he leaves, all the while having already sent Javelins of Light to blow up Aryan Road as revenge. Edelgard and her inner circle are taken by surprise, but quickly play around the dilemma by framing the church for the attack instead. In Chapter 17, by proxy of the Abyssal document, it's implied the crest stones the Kingdom Army uses against the Empire originate from way back when the Agarthans helped Lug archive Fargus's independence. A popular theory states that this essentially alluded that Dimitri's thirst for revenge and potentially his survival of the tragedy of Dusker was intended and that the Slitherers were capitalizing on it. But in saying this, this is a theory and not proven as we're never actually sure if Dimitri was intended to survive the tragedy or not. The Agarthans' last story appearance in Crimson Flower is in the endgame, as Arundel shows up to watch the final battle against Rhea from the sidelines. He suggests Edelgard to pursue the world conquest later down the line, but she refuses. And in the end, both parties make clear they'll keep working together, for a bit longer, up until their interests no longer align. Afterward, the epilogue and multiple character endings confirm the Empire's fight with the Agarthans was handled in secret and sometimes after Rhea's fall, eventually bringing them down in Shambhala, their headquarters. And that is just one of the potential outcomes. As for the paths where Edelgard is left on her own, she ends up going with the original plan of deploying demonic beasts for her invasion of Garrick Mach. At a certain point, she calls forth reserve troops, forcing Rhea to transform into a dragon to fight them off, but is soon ambushed and overwhelmed by those who slither in the dark's demonic beasts. And while Byleth tries to help Rhea, Talus seizes the chance to blast Byleth into a canyon and render them missing in action. Thus securing the win. 
Rhea is then captured in secret and jailed below Enbar's Imperial Palace, with Edelgard planning to use her as insurance against the Slitherers in the future. Edelgard also grows colder and harsher, stripping House Eyre of all of its power and privileges, including Duke Eyre's right to manage the Hrim territory. As a result, Arendelle slash Tallis takes over his role and uses it to impose harsh taxes on its citizens while killing anyone that refused conscription, all under Duke Eyre's name. And since the Duke's previous management of Hrim had already been bad for the citizens, once he finally escapes from his house arrest and seeks help in Hrim, well, the following occurs. Meanwhile in Fargus, Cornelia takes advantage of the chaos by killing Rufus, the kingdom regent, and frames Dimitri for it claiming his desire for vengeance likely convinced him of the rumors that Rufus had taken part in the tragedy of Dusker. Dedu's intervention saves his liege at the last second from execution, but Cornelia keeps the illusion Dimitri had died anyway. And with Fargus's royal line seemingly gone, Cornelia seizes power, forms the Fargus dukedom, and capitulates in favor of the Empire, while squeezing her territory's resources dry, leaving the kingdom weakened against Adrestia and with few houses providing resistance. Azur Moon. Upon regaining his senses and committing himself for his people as atonement, Dimitri directs his troops and the church's forces to reclaim Fargus in chapter 18 and defeat Cornelia. On her deathbed, Cornelia reveals to Dimitri, just to spite him, of his stepmother Patricia's involvement with the tragedy of Dusker. And while Dimitri is understandably skeptical of her words at first, Cornelia unintentionally diffuses all of the anger Dimitri had attributed to Edelgard for the tragedy five years past. In Chapter 19, Dimitri tells Byleth he had long since suspected Arundel was involved with the tragedy of Dusker due to his sudden change of behavior back in Ferdiad, and he had used his time in Garrick Mach to research his actions further. Later on, the kingdom helps Claude's force fight off Arundel's imperial troops in Deirdre, and after he's defeated, Dimitri demands him the answers he's been seeking from him. Uncle, I need to know. The incident nine years ago. You were involved, weren't you? You know something. What did Cornelia- No. What did my stepmother do? You are not qualified to look into the darkness. You and Edelgard. Do your best to kill each other. You are family after all. Finally, a few Slitherer troops are seen supporting Edelgard's last stand against the kingdom, and should the squad's leader end up defeated, all of his soldiers quickly escape from the battle, believing risking their end goal isn't worth it. Verdant Wind and Silver Snow in what's implied a coordinated effort between Edelgard and the Slitherers, in Chapter 17-18, a javelin of light is sent towards Fort Mercius as Byleth and Claude infiltrate the fort in an attempt to defeat the Empire's opposition in one fell swoop. The plan fails because of the fort's commander, the Death Knight, lures the enemy out of the area on what essentially is a whim. The gangs certainly rattled by the missiles at first, but quickly recover their composure shortly after. In the next chapter, during the surprise invasion of Enbar, a few Agarthan troops can be seen deployed to aid the Empire's counterattack, all of which vanish once Edelgard is finally killed. Before the gang declares victory though, a soldier gives them a letter from Hubert who posthumously tells them there is still unfinished business left with those who slither in the dark, gives them the coordinates of their headquarters obtained through the missile they used chapter ago, and also reveals where Rhea is being kept in the palace so they can do something about it. And per the monastery dialogue, Cornelia straight up vanishes upon knowing the Empire fell and is never heard from again. Q Chapter 20 21, and Byleth and Claude invade Shambhala. Catching the Slitherers off guard, Tullus deploys every resource available to get rid of them but ends up defeated. As a last resort, he summons multiple missiles to kill everyone before the debris crushes him. And while in Silver Snow this is the last time the Agarthans show up, the wounds Rhea suffers from Tullus' missiles play a factor in the Dragon Generation that overcomes her at the last minute and turns her into the final boss. By comparison, Inverdant wins and game, Nemesis awakens in Shambhala's catacombs after its destruction, and marches to Garrick Mach along with the replica hero relics and an undead army, all but stated to have been reanimated by the Agarthans to get his payback on Saros. When the Alliance intercepts his forces, similar to Azermoon's final battle, a few Slitherers are found providing reinforcements that can also be made to flee just by killing their commander. On a closing note, despite these three routes directly dealing with those who slither in the dark one way or another, a 
few character endings mention the group still survives and does try causing trouble many years later before being defeated yet again. Given everything we've reviewed, there are many aspects from the Agarthans' history that stand out in the context of Three Houses' backstory. Agartha's beef with Sothis and her kids began for relatively grounded reasons, before their descendants devolved it into a millennial xenophobic revenge quest. They're responsible for building Fodlan's current landscape, first by literally blowing up stuff in their battle with Sothis, later through instigating Nemesis' lust for power which genocided nearly all Nabataeans, and third by helping Fargus splitting the Empire. The gang has tried taking over Fodlan at least three times before the main plot. There are gaps of history in which we have no clue what they were doing. Their impersonation shenanigans are, from what we know, a recent development. After their fall from grace, their overall plan of action has consisted in acting as someone else's benefactor and or latching onto nearby conflicts to reap the benefits. Their involvement with the Empire and Kingdom helped consolidate Edelgard and Dimitri's motivations in the present. Finally, the group's interest on Seros's alleged bones, and later the Sword of the Creator, early in the story is intriguing in hindsight. In Three Houses, Edelgard is the only lord whose lineage in universe lacks a relic slash regalia, synergistic with her crest, and not only both the Sword of the Creator and a relic forged from Saros's remains would have been perfect for her in different circumstances, her part 2 weapon, the Emir, is low-key stated in its description and by the ore needed to repair it to be an Agarthan creation built for her and her alone. Things get interesting if we talk about the Agarthans' purpose in the main narrative though, mostly because they serve as secondary antagonists as a whole, getting three chapters of focus pre-time skip, two in Azur Moon, and one in Vernant Wind slash Silver Snow. Their actions in part one lead to Geralt's death and Byleth fusing with Sothis. Meanwhile, Crimson Flower uses them to explore the nature of their alliance with the Empire. In Azur Moon, they help explore the tragedy of Dusker's subplot, and in Vernant Wind slash Silver Snow, they set up each route's final boss. Without Byleth's support, the group provides Edelgard the means to take Rhea out of the war and massively weaken the kingdom. Three Houses lore and background information is honestly freaking incredible. For better or worse, it is hidden behind text, random exchanges of dialogue, biased library entries, DLC library entries, and so on. There are no neutral, unbiased narrators here, and the truth to everything that happens in this world lies in the middle between every one of these narrators. It's difficult to really form a strong opinion on the Slitherers because information on them is so fragmented throughout the game. But the last, like, 5,000 words served as a history of the Agarthans who were pushed underground from their battle against Sothis. The original Agarthans and those who slither in the dark are different. The Agarthans were simply the humans before Sothis and her children arrived. The Slitherers are Agarthans, yes, but more accurately the Agarthans who had to go into hiding after their failed attempt at destroying Sothis, her children, and the Nabataean cities with the first Javelins of Light ever launched on record. These first Agarthans did in fact destroy cities, did in fact kill Nabataeans, but failed to do anything more. Recalling back to this, the land of Thinis, where the old gods are said to live, the false god has awakened. Its looming, heteromorphic vessel was resurrected to sink the world to the depths of the ocean. It will bring extinction to all children of men and salvation to all beasts of the land, sky, and sea. For the children of men who spilled too much of the blood of life, it promises only cruel retribution. While the author is unknown, it is clear this comes from a living Agarthan from before the Slitherer era. The author prophesied a cruel retribution, in other words, they are anticipating Sothis's retaliation against her children and cities from the Agarthans. Trying to figure out why the Agarthans even wanted to kill Sothis is a bit of a headache, as this is a significant missing piece to the history of the continent. All we know is that Sothis arrived with her children unannounced, and for a time shared her knowledge with the original humans until they grew frustrated and resentful towards her. What would that actually look like would be nice to know, because Rhea will tell you that humans misused this knowledge given to them and started to go to war with each other, grew too prideful, and turned their backs on Sothis. But the Agarthans will tell you that Sothis, the false god, the fell star, 
the omen of disaster will ruin the land. Whatever symbiosis that was there had been lost, and they saw her as their enemy. Were the old Agarthan beliefs driven out? Was Sothis' rule oppressive? Was there some ancient colonialization going on? It could very well have been. But while incredibly mighty, were not enough. They were absolutely screwed at this point. With their nukes, their best chance to rid Sothis of their world was gone. Hopeless, defeated, and wanted, the remaining surviving Agarthans retreated underground, never to be heard from again. Until Nemesis. I'll be super honest. Everything the Slitherers do is really cool. All of their important historic moves after this point, recruiting Nemesis to sneak into Sothis's resting place to kill her, steal her remains, drink her blood to inherit the Crest of Flames, craft her bones and heart into the Sword of the Creator, then get Nemesis to destroy Nabataean cities, kill more Nabataeans, get more weapons, then to Nemesis recruiting who would become the Ten Elites, and all of this culminating into the War of Heroes where Nemesis would lose is honestly genius, even if their goal failed. The Slitherers took a huge W here when considering that revenge against Sothis was their initial goal after going underground. All of the moves that followed almost had them win against Nabatea and the surface world for a second time. Were it not for the formation of the Adrestian Empire to ally with the Church of Seros to fight Nemesis's army including the elites and their super weapons, the continent would have been completely different. The Slitherers just lost that war essentially fair and square. But the formation of Fargus and the splitting of the Empire could only have been possible after they intervened and helped Lug's rebellion. Fargus is one of, if not my favorite region in Fire Emblem ever to think about for this reason. Pan, the mysterious tactician, is a huge question mark in all of this. But I like to think that Pan is really something like Talus's predecessor. Pan was instrumental in providing weapons and soldiers to Lug to make him capable enough to split from the Empire. The formation of Fargus, and by consequence the weakening of the Empire and the Church of Seros, was a huge win in the Slitherers' history. It also continues the pattern of how the Slitherers operate. They latch onto a greater power and push towards their goals. They recruit Nemesis to spearhead an army against Seros. Now, they embolden Lug by giving him a fighting chance against the Empire, and eventually, Talus would follow suit with Edelgard, creating a weapon to contest the church, essentially Nemesis 2.0. The Slitherers honestly kick ass as a competent anti-church group. They're smart, calculated, and successful, all the while continuing to elude their beast overlords from figuring out where they are and even better, who they are. The modern Slitherers, Talus, Solon, Kranya, and Cornelia, they all have their positive and negatives. The best place to start with assessing and giving an opinion on the current era of Slitherers is starting with the tragedy of Dusker and focusing on Talus's major moves. I overall think the tragedy of Dusker was a smart move to disrupt the country they had historically helped form in the past. Cornelia had already infiltrated the kingdom and had a lot of power to make decisions. This would become even more prominent now that Lambert was gone, and with Dusker taking the blame for the regicide, the Slitherers once again got off scot-free. The one thing that annoys me about the tragedy was Dimitri's survival. In my Edelgard video, I ran with the theory that Dimitri's survival was intentional on Talos's part, as it would give him an heir to the throne whose vendetta could possibly be used in the long term in case the Slitherers could stand to benefit from another war between the Empire and the Kingdom. In hindsight, I really should have either been more clear that it was strictly a theory or should not have mentioned this at all. It was a minor point in the grand scheme of the Dimitri section of that video, and it was only like two minutes out of a over two hour video, but I feel like I must mention this here, as some took it to discredit the rest of the section and at worst would be understandably distracted or confused. It's the one thing of that whole video that I regret, but hey, what can you do? You live and you learn. Because really, Dimitri surviving is just a thing that happened. The story justifies his survival by saying that Gilbert made it just in time to mend his otherwise lethal wounds. This would make it just an unfortunate accident in the tragedy that instead of rectifying by Tullus killing Dimitri, later Tullus would just deal with it later or use it to his advantage. Don't get me wrong, Dimitri's accidental survival is something I find very silly if it was unintentional. I don't know how a young, defenseless boy and of being the last kid standing, sees his father beheaded in front of him, then gets attacked afterwards. But the Slitherers neglect to make sure the Prince, one of the most important pieces in this scheme to actually kill, is for sure dead. I've heard theories that his crest procced and that made him survive, but even then, keeping Dimitri around has no known strategic benefit to Talus unless he adapts and make it beneficial. But we never know either way. Nothing about Dimitri's survival, intentional or not, 
is satisfactory, nor is it fully backed by in-game evidence. If you go with the theory that Dimitri's survival was intentional, the evidence rests on certain interpretations of Edelgard's words after Dimitri dies in Crimson Flower and Arundel's exchange to Dimitri after he defeats him in Azur Moon, but also relies on the possibility that Arundel could have predicted Dimitri would aim to discover that he was a suspect in the tragedy years later into his adolescent years so as to spark an international conflict between himself, Adrestia's regent, and his nephew, the King of Fargus, and have the Slitherers be the benefactor of that conflict like they historically often do. And while that reality would have been insanely cool and make Tullus look even more of a supremely evil genius, there's just not enough confirmation to back it. And this could have honestly very well have been a short-sighted writing decision that would frustrate me and a small handful of 3H lore heads years later. Another theory brought up around Tullus is his supposed time wizard powers versus Byleth when she attempts to save Geralt. Many people interpret Tullus's interruption upon Byleth's strike at Monica as him being able to stop her time time manipulation, but that is simply not the case. In reality, Tullus didn't reverse the time travel, he was just always there, overseeing Monica's mission in the church, and when he saw that Byleth wanted to kill Monica, he simply interrupted. He didn't appear the first time because he didn't need to, as Byleth didn't attack Monica. This, for better or worse? just makes Tullus into an otherwise normal villain without anything terribly remarkable about him besides that he's an evil genius. But it does make me wonder if this time wizard theory about Tullus could actually have some truth to it in three hopes. Maybe that purple haired dude is a time wizard with the help from whoever is this white haired maybe god person? Dragon? Kid? To contest Sothis. Who knows? It's fun to think about though. Tullus is otherwise fine as a villain in most routes. He does typical Slitherer leader things in Silver Snow and Verdant Wind, gets killed in Azur Moon, but in my opinion is worse in Crimson Flower. The Slitherers and their ancestors, the surface Agarthans, all have one major flaw that often screws them over, and Tullus is no different hubris. Crimson Flower features the first explicit, inexcusable by the church betrayal of trust by Edelgard, in which she decides to divert herself and the Black Eagle Strike Force to Aryan Road to not only seize the Silver Maiden for strategic purposes, but also to kill Cornelia, one of the highest ranking members of the Slitherers. This act directly tells Tullus that Edelgard, the weapon he created for the purpose to serve his ambitions against Saros and the church, is not completely under his control and is willing to act on her own interests and against that of the Agarthans, and also that Edelgard is willing to kill the Slitherers that get in her way, despite their apparent alliance. And in a very rash and short-sighted response, Arundel launches Javelins of Light onto Aryan Road as a show of force, attempting to intimidate Edelgard so as to warn her to never betray him like this again. Narratively, this, and also Talus's condescending behavior and treatment of Hubert and Edelgard in Hubert's paralogue, are both failures in his attempt to intimidate and keep them in line, and exposes Tullus' weaknesses, pride. The Agarthans' downfall, just like before, will be their conceit. They think they're the greatest beings on Earth. The notable Slitherers all show complete contempt for surface humans, going as far as to call them beasts, but the constant underestimation of every single one of them not named Byleth screws them over. Tullus launching the Javelins, easily the greatest resource to even the playing field against Saros, the other Nabataeans, and virtually every army ever is wasted on essentially a flex. And like in the paralogue, it backfires. Arundel ends up showing his hand to Edelgard, exposes his trump card, and now in some unexplainable way, Hubert can track their location to their base. It was the stupidest thing Arundel could do. And it makes me not like Tullus as a villain anymore. The tragedy of Dusker, besides the weird Dimitri fate thing, was cunning and for the most part worked. Replacing Lord Arundel at the perfect time was a power move to gain control of the Empire's elite and allow him to go through with the slithery experiments on Edelgard and her siblings. Spending his time in the church to oversee Solon and Kranya's tasks in Garrig Mach paid off by rescuing Monica from Byleth. Coming up with the plan to seal Byleth away, the Sword of the Creator, or not, showed situational awareness and indicated that Talus was operating under a sense of urgency. In Crimson Flower's war phase, as Edelgard was growing rebellious and uncontrollable, he maintained his distance and didn't get involved in her actions. The Talus we come to know is like this era's pan, constantly making rational, well-thought-out moves. And even though hubris is a recurring motif for the Agarthans, Hubert's paralogue, which in fairness is optional, captures Arundel's hubris while also continuing to make him out to be a frustratingly clever and elusive enemy 
to Edelgard that she must cooperate with. The main story, the unavoidable and unmissable act of launching the missiles serves the same narrative motif, but at what cost? It contradicts everything Tullus has done in the story. I know it's easy to critique character's actions because we look at the acts of a character from the outside looking in, but Tullus is like a cold, unfeeling sociopath, my dude. Impulsiveness and irrational behavior doesn't ever follow his MO. Was it just a cheap and easy means to set up an epilogical ending where Shambhala falls in the Shadow War? Probably, I guess? It's the only way Hubert can locate their lair for that invasion to even happen in Crimson Flower. To me, it strikes me as a foolish and uncharacteristic move that attempts to serve motifs of the Slitherers, but is executed in an at-best questionable way. So then, what would be the alternative here? Well, I'm not a professional writer, but I do have some thoughts. I have two takes on this. Number one, and most importantly, why react at all? The Agarthans usually play the long game, biding their time for revenge. I don't see how Tullus couldn't just remember what Edelgard did and use it against her later, dropping the javelins on them in their potential war after Edelgard wins against the church and unifies the continent. Or to attempt to assassinate her or Hubert in the future would all be actions in line more with Tullus' schemes. But if you wanted to run with the failed attempt at an intimidation at the expense of valuable resources, I would honestly just repurpose Hubert's paralogue altogether. Hubert's paralogue serves to expose Tullus' overconfidence and underestimate estimation of Edelgard by getting her to help the Slitherers control demonic beasts. But what about repurposing the beast thing and just have Tullus sick demonic beasts on Aryan Road? What about opening up Hubert's paralog only after this chapter? This also exposes Tullus's retribution against Edelgard, who, with the context of never actually having to fight the Slitherer's beast in Crimson Flower, would be some show of force by Tullus with the intent to flex on how powerful the Slitherers are. Remember that intimidation was the exact flex Tullus tried to pull on Edelgard anyway in that paralog. Sure, it's not as scary as nuclear your missiles, but at least you keep your trump card a secret. But in any case, like I just mentioned, I think the smartest thing Talus could do would just be to wait. Sure, he could react negatively and condemn Edelgard when they talk in Aryan Road, but he could also just threaten some form of Talus will remember this, if you catch my drift. But of course, this would also require a resolution to Talus, which we also don't get in Crimson Flower anyway, except for the epilogue. Whatever. Moving on. Tallis is a letdown, in my opinion, and it's especially disappointing because I genuinely think he could have been one of the more memorable villains in the series as a whole, but different routes showcase variously unfortunately disappointing endnotes for the guy. In Silver Snow and Verdant Wind, he's not really a presence at all, and appearing at the very end not having much of any relevant connection to anyone, not even Byleth. In Ezra Moon, he's dead before most players even know what the fuck is happening, or who he even is. And in Crimson Flower, where I think he's his best, he's forced to to act in a weirdly unslithery way that I personally don't like for the sake to serve a narrative. Which would be more forgiving, but he's a victim of this game's treatment of their Shadow War being epilogue content. So yeah, similar but different criticisms can be laid to the Slitherer's other relevant characters, Kranja, Solon, and Cornelia. Kranja is universally thought of as a giant missed opportunity and gone too soon. But I'll be honest, I never really thought this. She served her purpose as a flunky to Talus and was integral to push the plot towards Byleth's ascension. She's otherwise an irredeemable, comically evil Slitherer, but she serves her purpose as a villain. Everything she does is executed well. She successfully frames Dimitri for the murder of Rufus, she controls Fargus for as long as she can until she's caught by surprise by Dimitri's return, and in Silver Snow and Verdant Wind, just escapes with her life intact, never to be seen again. She doesn't really ever make mistakes on her own accord. Solon, in my opinion, is the best villain here, and in some ways, he's better than Talus. Solon is very smart, and one of my favorite villains in this game. Or perhaps my favorite actually. I'd argue he was the best at actually concealing his identity. In fairness, he was a simple librarian, but considering that he's a Slitherer who, when in disguise, did not raise any eyebrows whatsoever to the church staff, namely Sedith, he fully embraced Tomas's kind and benevolent behavior. When you look in contrast, Monica was noticeably suspect and seemed annoyingly hard to keep in line by Edelgard and Hubert. Arundel and Cornelia had noticeable personality changes, the latter even having been acknowledged by random soldiers. To add on to this, his actions towards Claude by giving him clues to his investigation into the church to fuel suspicion and distrust within him 
also succeeded. It's a moment that I don't think is talked about enough, because unbeknownst to Claude, a Slitherer was helping him this entire time. I especially like the whole Spell of Zaharas thing. He executes the ritual for the spell flawlessly. I appreciate him acknowledging that they lost the Sword of the Creator in the process, and you can really tell this was a bittersweet moment for him. But in this moment, Solon actually won. It wasn't until the sothis byleth merger and their ascension that foiled his plans, but were it not for that, Solon just changed the course of history in Fodolin, really being the savior of all. It's pretty crazy to think about. I've seen criticism online that the Slitherers left a lot to be desired, and that they were wasted potential, and they weren't characters so much as simply plot devices. And to an extent, I can see where these complaints come from. There's only four noteworthy Slitherers in this game, and two of them, Cornelia and Talus, have different fates depending on the route. As for wasted potential, in my opinion, I would levy this at Talus for the reasons I already mentioned. Cornelia's purpose was pretty cut and dry, and I honestly don't mind that she up and vanishes in Silver Snow and Verdant Wind. Kranya and Solon, yes, are plot devices, and they're both very short-lived and are meant to push the story along, but like, they're early game villains? So I think their role and fates are defensible enough. As a general criticism, with the Slitherers with a face and a name, none of them are at all redeemable. They're like, all evil, spiteful, and as condescending as can be. The only person who like, semi-breaks this is Kranya at the very end, when she reaches out to Byleth begging for them to save her. But outside of that, they're all pieces of shit. With the exception of Lysithia in Crimson Flower, there is not a single enemy recruitable character in this game. And even she's a weird case, along with Ash and Lawrence, since they're like recruitable already in the academy phase. So I'll actually rephrase this. There is not a single recruitable character that came from the enemy faction, nor a recruitable that has an affiliation with the Slitherers. This severely compromises any further understanding of Agarthan culture, motives, history, or anything. Consider other characters that were closely affiliated with enemy groups and how their characterization served to provide a greater understanding of the enemy because of it, or at the very least, showed that not all enemies you are fighting are irredeemable assholes. Whether it's someone like Renault in Blazing Sword, a late game bishop character with a personal history with Nurgle himself and helps to provide more information behind morphs, Nino is a recruitable enemy in FE7 who narratively assists in humanizing nearly all of the four fangs. Salem, a former Lopto priest who abandoned the church and went on the run, showcased that not all Lopter enemies are simply child-hunting zealots. And they don't even need to be recruitable. Mustafa is a throwaway enemy character or an awakening lasting one chapter, but is incredibly popular for being redeemable and showing the player that not all Plagians are of the same mind. Without a Navarre or a Camus even, the Slitherers are just generic evil bad guys without any room for nuance or reasons to be cared or remembered. Imagine being as bad as the Doom of Faithful, but actually worse on the count of not having a Halcyon equivalent character. Can you imagine how sick it would be if you recruited a Slitherer who started not to buy the misinformation being fed to them from Talus, a Slitherer who escaped Shambhala and wanted to explore the outside world, and we got supports from that character. We could have learned more about the notable Slitherers, the culture of Agartha past what we are told, how they were able to advance their technology so past beyond Fodlands. What if Kranya was like relatively grounded instead of a psycho clown murderer? Could she have offered a more sympathetic angle to look at the Slitherers? What if there was simply an NPC like Halcyon that could have indicated the Slitherers weren't all bad. Sadly, no such character exists, and it makes this entire group generically evil, which is legitimately not normal for this series at all. I've gone on long enough. I do think there are a lot of good, cool things about this organization, but the Talus era Slitherers, especially Talus himself, could have had more to them as this game's group of antagonists. I do have hopes for three hopes. I don't know what direction the antagonists will be taking in that game, but I do wish the enemy faction to have more substance to them than in the original timeline. Well everybody, that will do it for today's video. It was a huge essay on the slithery boys and girls of Fodlan, and if you enjoyed and are still watching, please comment down below your take on these mole people. Your engagement with this video will help boost it in YouTube searches, and that means more people can potentially see this sick, 
content. And if you haven't subscribed yet, but this video has shown up in your recommended feed, please subscribe. This channel is dedicated to Fire Emblem content and we'll be covering more Three Houses and general Fire Emblem stuff in the future, just like it always has been. The channel also just hit 92,000 subscribers, and now it's only 8,000 away from that elusive plaque. Every subscriber counts. With that all being said, folks, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of your week. Deuces.